This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Yes, all our hard work and efforts the past week has come to this an entire 30 minutes dedicated to Georgia agriculture. Welcome. So glad you tuned into the Farm Monitor. As the nice man said, he is Kenny Bergamy. And he is Ray D'Alessio. And as always, we've got a lot of good stories for you. Case in point, from the depths of Georgia's coast emerges a new delicacy. Get ready to savor the taste of home with Tybee Oyster Company. Also on the show, a historic drop in the U.S. cattle inventory has producers on edge. Find out what's driving the decline and how they're navigating the many challenges that lie ahead. Plus... Well, everybody, Ranger Nick, coming up a little bit later, I'm hanging out with a scientist who's studying a living dinosaur. We're talking about the short-nosed sturgeon inside of this tank, a federally endangered species, but one that is known for delicious caviar. I'll explain what UGA is studying about these creatures a little bit later. That and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. As if Georgia's agricultural landscape wasn't already diverse, now the Tybee Oyster Company in Savannah is adding a unique twist to the mix. Damon Jones takes us behind the scenes for an up-close look at their operation, revealing why oysters could soon become the next big thing here. While shrimping has been a staple of the Georgia coast for more than a century, there could be a new player in town thanks to the husband and wife team of Laura and Perry Solomon. Coming off their first harvest season, the Tybee Oyster Company is a culmination of an idea years in the making. Actually, in college, we would come down here on the weekends and go harvest wild oysters. So to us, they're a taste of home. I mean, it never really occurred to us that uh, people wouldn't think the same. Uh, they're a lot harder to get when you have to go stand in the mud and pickaxe them. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they're a taste of home for us. They're a, a phenomenal oyster. So we're really excited to see it on a plate in restaurants. One of the reasons for their success is all of the time and effort that goes into maintaining this floating oyster farm throughout the year. It's a production practice that allows for more quality control without sacrificing any of the nutrition. Floating oyster farm just means that instead of the oysters growing wild on the banks and clumps, um, they're actually floating on the surface of the water. And depending on what region you're in, you know, different, different areas do it slightly differently. But for us, they sit in that top part of the water column where all the nutrients and algae are flowing through. We have a lot of wave energy on our lease. The Tybee Oyster Company is a pioneer when it comes to promoting the oyster industry here in Georgia, as it is the first of what is likely to become many such businesses along the coast. 2019, there was legislation passed asking the DNR to create a framework for farmed oysters. Um, the first leases were issued in 2022, and we're the first leaseholders farming, and that began in 2023. So from a regulatory standpoint, it's it's been a slow road, um, but I, with the support we're seeing, I think it's going to take off pretty quickly. Another reason for optimism is the acclaim these oysters are already receiving from both restaurants and their customers for its unique taste that can only be achieved by growing them here on the Bull River. We call them salt bombs. Uh, that is an apt name. They're very briny with kind of a sweet finish in the adductor muscle. Um, but in addition to the brininess, you know, you can see the local Spartina grass that's everywhere. So they do have kind of that lemongrass note you'll pick up on. They're definitely not as minerally as an oyster from the Northeast. And, you know, it's, it's really cool. You talk about wine and how it tastes based on where it's grown. Oysters are very similar to that. While it's that taste of home that initially drew the Solomons into the oyster business, it's their drive and passion for producing locally sustainable and eco-friendly seafood that motivates them every day. We are into sustainability and helping to support our ecosystem for the next generations. Oysters are a great food, uh, food source to do that. Um, they're one of the greenest proteins on the planet. So that's, that's one motivation. Another is just you know, we're passionate that local food is kind of the last standing souvenir in an economy when you can buy anything from anywhere. You know, you travel and um, you have local food or you grow up in an area and have local food. It's a lot more meaningful in today's day and age. So we wanted to get Georgia Seafood back on the menus. Reporting from Chatham County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. 
Thank you, Damon. Let's take you from Savannah to Fayetteville, where Georgia Farm Bureau shook things up a bit with their district president's meetings. You see, unlike in years past, where all the presidents gathered in one spot, this time they split it into smaller sessions. At this particular meeting, we had presidents from districts three and five. Why the change, you ask? Well, they wanted to keep it intimate and informal while still sharing all the important organization updates. It is one of the most valuable uh, opportunities throughout the year to, to reconnect with our people uh, throughout the state, understand the problems that they're dealing with, um, and how we can best approach them. So this is probably one of the best uh, meetings we have of the year, just getting to visit with them, hear their issues, and, and, and hear what we're doing right and what we can improve on to make this the best organization we can make it. Well, Georgia's youngest certified farmer is at it again, showing off her love for agriculture and teaching others about backyard gardening. This time, eight-year-old Kendall Ray Johnson opened her farm to nearly two dozen students from Stella Charter High School in Los Angeles who were touring Georgia colleges and universities as part of a service project. Kendall said she couldn't wait to show the students what farm life is all about. And let me tell you, judging by the group's reaction, she made quite the impression. She's very passionate about what she does. She's very knowledgeable. She's excited. She has a way of just this magnetic energy about herself. Students are very excited and inspired, and that's why we came. When we heard about our story, when we heard about all the great work she was doing, we wanted to come and give back and support her, and that's what we're about here at Stella High Charter Academy. One of the reasons why she does this is, you know, she want to meet new friends, she want to make new things, and she want to inspire other kids, and that's exactly what she's doing. Well, last week we told you about the escalating beef prices driven by the dwindling U.S. cattle herd, which hasn't seen this type of decline in over 70 years. Yet this surge in cost is only half the story. The Monitor's John Holcomb sheds light on the factors behind the decline and its implications for cattle producers moving forward. According to the USDA, for the first time since 1951, the U.S. cattle inventory has dropped to its lowest point as producers across the country deal with a plethora of issues such as record high input costs mixed with harsh droughts that left many producers in a bind. A lot of that has to do with weather. The, uh, the fact that much of the U.S. was in drought uh, for a large part of last year caused a significant amount here in Georgia, uh, especially in our northwest and southwest Georgia. Uh, we had a lot of producers that had to, to start feeding hay significantly earlier than what they would normally do, and that's caused a lot of uh, additional culling um, to it, but also with an increase in prices that we saw, we have a lot of producers that, that are able to take that opportunity. As a result, Sandlin says cattle prices will be on the rise in the coming months. However, the question is whether or not producers will be able to hold on for those higher prices as expenses are higher than ever. One of the effects that, that uh, our cattle producers here are going to have to look at is can they afford to feed these cattle and, and hold on to the, them long enough to take advantage of the higher prices. Uh, they're projecting that the prices will stick around somewhere through 2025, even possibly into 2026, depending on the buildup. Uh, but a large number of producers are having to deal with higher input costs that they saw last year, and that's that's weighing in on the profits that they received on that this uh, last batch of cattle. So, um, if they're able to hold on to them and feed them longer, I think those those producers will be rewarded for those efforts. Sandlin believes that for those producers that can hold on and don't sell out, it will give them an opportunity to improve their herds as they can focus on rebuilding, but says that will also be contingent upon the weather and forage quality returning back to normal. I think we're going to see a, a measured approach coming back uh, from this lower inventory number. It'll take longer to rebuild the herd, and a large portion of that too is going to be the weather. If we don't get uh, good rains here in Georgia and we don't have forage uh, increasing, you're not going to see a lot of producers that are quick to go back and rebuild the herd. One of the things that you'll see for those generational producers that are, are in it for the long haul, they're going to be taking the, the higher prices and, and profits that they received on that and putting that back into, the in, into their farms and operations. Uh, that's setting up the next generation for quite a bit of success in doing that. The, the trick is being able to do that in coupling with higher input costs as well as, as making things work. 
Um, you're also seeing a, a lot of culling of the herds right now, largely dependent on uh, the quality of the cattle that they've got. And so while those producers have got a little, uh, a little bit extra funds in their pocket now, they're taking this opportunity to improve their herds, improve those genetics, to reconsider uh, some of their stock and breeding stock and making sure that they're setting up that, that operation for the long future. Reporting in Atlanta for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Hey everybody, Ranger there. Coming up after the break, I'm hanging out with a short-nosed sturgeon, a living fossil in the fresh waters of South Georgia rivers. What is it that we need to know about this fish? I'll explain after the break. For decades, Georgia has been the poultry capital of the world. Through trusted research and constant innovation, the University of Georgia's Department of Poultry Science has revolutionized the economy of Georgia and helped shape how an entire nation eats for over 100 years. At the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, we are committed to developing the next generation of leaders for the poultry science sector in Georgia and beyond. CAES faculty are preparing for the next century of success by providing students with a world-class poultry science education. Students have the opportunity to work with poultry in a number of ways, whether studying avian genetics, improving bird health through nutrition, learning surgical techniques, or honing their business skills for the management of people, businesses, and production. At CAES, we are working to make poultry production safer, healthier, and more efficient through our commitment to sustainably feeding the world's growing population. Our focus on avian genetics, health, food safety, physiology, and management spans beyond the classroom. Coupled with a variety of degree options, hands-on research experiences, and individual attention from faculty, UGA CAES students have endless opportunities to learn. Students can participate in outreach and education opportunities throughout the community. They also gain hands-on research and teaching experiences through department internships or with our many partners in the public and private sectors. Our students are ready to take their degrees to the next level. Their education prepares them for a wide range of graduate and professional programs, including veterinary and human medicine. And while our reach is wide, our department is tight-knit. Students learn from each other and push each other towards success. Students also work side by side with internationally recognized faculty who are performing cutting edge research in a variety of areas. As a result, poultry science students graduate as top competitors in their field, ready to become exceptional leaders in science and industry. Join us as we commit to innovating the poultry sciences and feeding the world for generations to come. What you're looking at there is this beautiful fish that's in the rivers of South Georgia. That's the short-nosed sturgeon. That's the living fossil. And I'm going to introduce you to somebody who's studying that living fossil and is the opposite of a living fossil, a bright young mind, Dr. Adam Fox. So good to be with you, Doc. Thanks. I appreciate you spending some time with us. We are in the tank with short-nosed sturgeons, two of them, in fact, right here with the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And Dr. Fox is studying sturgeon. And Doc, what are some of the things that you are asking yourself, question-wise, on this federally endangered species? Sure, so short-nosed sturgeon um, were once targets of a really um, valuable fishery. Uh, they were harvested for their meat and their caviar, and that led to a major decline in their population. So uh, they were actually uh, listed as endangered on the first Endangered Species Act way back in the 1960s. Mm, okay. And unfortunately, their populations haven't really recovered 
uh, even though they've been protected from harvest. And so my work is looking at short nose sturgeon in all of Georgia's Atlantic Coast rivers, okay. and we're trying to figure out their abundance, how many there are, and um, maybe be able to look into some of the reasons why they're not recovering. It's interesting, and, and probably looking at things like how they're moving, their population dynamics, and those kinds of things. Yeah, so we're interested in recruitment, which is how many new sturgeon are coming into the population each year, how many are being born, okay. what their habitat is. So we do studies that track them as they move through the rivers and estuaries. And um, they'll also occasionally move out to the, uh, to the ocean and visit other rivers as well. And it's that harvesting, it's that kind of potentially erosion that got into the water that impacted this species that you're looking to do something about. So yeah, um, eventually the goal is to have enough short nose sturgeon that they might one day support a fishery again. And so in order to do that, um, that recovery is gonna be a very long time frame. but in order to do that, we need to know how they are doing now and what we can do um, to uh, help them recover. And that's something that I want the folks at home to know about is even in a school of forestry and natural resources, studying endangered species like these fish is incredible. Well, what I wanna do, Doc, is in this next part, get a hold of one of these, bring one of these beauties out of the water and do some of the measurements on them that you're doing to show the folks at home some of the things a fisheries biologist does. So let's go there next. All right, so Mr. Sturgeon is out of the water and we wanna do this kind of quick to prevent him from being overstressed. But Doc, what are we gonna measure with this animal? So when we handle these fish, uh, we measure uh, mostly just their length so that we take two different length measurements. The first is total length. So that's from the tip of his snout to the tip of his tail. Mm -hmm. And so on this fish, that is uh, about 915 millimeters. And then we also take fork length, which is to the deepest part of the fork in his tail. Okay. Um, and so that is about um, 805 millimeters. We want to measure uh, two lengths because sometimes they're missing the tip of their tail. If mm. a predator bites it off or a boat strike happens, um, we'll use their fork length. And we can use either of those lengths to uh, look at characteristics of the population, look at size structure, um, and estimate age as well, because they get bigger as they get older. Right, so about a three foot long fish. I'm holding this contraption, and Dr. Fox told me that I need to hold this button down, and I'm gonna run this up this sturgeon's body until it beeps. Up oh, there it went. And there is a number on this machine which tells us what, Doc? So this sturgeon has a microchip. Um, it's exactly like what you'd put in a pet cat or dog uh, so that it can be found if it gets lost. And so we tag our sturgeon so that uh, if we ever capture them again, we'll know who they are and we'll be able to figure out how much they've grown and where they've been, or at least where, they were, where they've moved from when they were caught to when they were recaught. That kind of population dynamic work is so important. And Doc, I want to get him back in the water, but just thank him so much for what you're doing. And folks, this is an endangered species right in the rivers of South Georgia, incredible. Let's put him back and let's talk a little bit about what the folks at home can do to help. Let's go there next. All right, so Doc, I was looking at that fish up close, the beautiful mouth, the bottom feeder. I'm thinking about salmon that are traveling up a river or a stream. Would that animal be traveling to find food or what would it be migrating? I hear about migrating, why? Yeah. So short nose sturgeon make uh, really long migrations to spawning habitats. So the adults like to live in the lower rivers near the ocean, but they'll swim 100 miles upstream to find the right kind of habitat to lay their eggs. And, uh, and then the juveniles will drift back down the river. So having that connected river ecosystem is really important for sturgeon. So that idea, as you're along a river, along the coastal plain of Georgia in the southeast, those rivers that lead to the ocean, these things, if you're standing there with your waders on fishing, could be lurking beneath you as you're fishing. If someone happens to find one, Dr. Fox and I were talking, there is a website and a number to call it Sturge, S-T-U-R-G 911. You can call if you happen to see one, see one in distress. Great thing that you can do to help. Doc, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you for the work that Dr. Fox is doing right here at UGA to help an endangered species. That's great stuff. A very efficient thing to do. So y'all know what to do. While you're online learning more about the short nose sturgeon, check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page and the Farm Monitor Facebook page and see what everybody's got going on. And until next time for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick reminding you as I always do that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here again this time next month. 
see ya. Well, if you're ready to explore the amazing world of agriculture, either on your phone or computer screen, the Farm Monitor has you covered. Check out our website, farm-monitor.com, for engaging articles and videos. And there's our YouTube channel, where you can catch up on missed episodes and past stories. From inspiring farmer profiles to deep agricultural insights, there's something for everyone. And the archives go as far back as 2009. Up next, tiny insects with a massive impact. Soar with the Georgia Forestry Commission as they combat the pint-sized threat devastating Georgia's pine forests. Every year, the Georgia Forestry Commission flies over 6,000 miles, surveying over 11,520,000 acres of Georgia's landscape, looking for signs of activity from an insect known as the southern pine beetle. While this insect is no longer than a grain of rice, the damage it causes to Georgia's pine forests is gigantic. Southern pine beetles attack and kill trees by creating winding tunnels underneath their bark to store their eggs. Don't worry, the Georgia Forestry Commission is always keeping an eye out for these insects. From June to September, we take to the skies to watch over Georgia's trees from above. This process begins with a little bit of planning. First things first, your local GFC Forester will partner with a member of our air operations team. Using data of the area, they will work together to determine the best route for observation. Once a route has been determined, then it's time to fly. The Forester and the pilot will begin circling the area looking out for any brown spots amid the green canopies, a sign of dying trees. If a potential pine beetle spot is sighted, it is logged on the map for further on the ground investigation. Once the flight is complete and any potential pine beetle spots are logged, a forester will then travel to these spots on the ground and investigate the trees further. In some cases, the forester will work with a private land consultant on the investigation as well. When they arrive on the scene, the forester will locate and assess the trees, looking for any surface level signs of beetle activity, including green needles scattered around the base of the tree and pitch tubes located in the bark. Then, the forester will remove a piece of the tree bark to check for the S-shaped markings caused by the southern pine beetles. Usually, if these tunnels are found, the forester will then confirm that the tree death in this spot is being caused by an outbreak of the southern pine beetles. The GFC forester will then take photos and log any evidence they find. If the presence of southern pine beetle is confirmed, the GFC forester will work with the landowner to determine the best next steps available to them. There are a few things that can be done to prevent the spreading of southern pine beetle, including thinning the pine stand, conducting a prescribed burn, or conducting a chemical release of non-pine trees. The Georgia Forestry Commission offers a southern pine beetle cost share program, and eligible landowners could be incentivized to complete these activities. Please contact your local GFC forester if you've seen any signs of southern pine beetle activity on your property. Your local GFC forester may also contact you if we notice any signs of southern pine beetle activity on your property during one of our aerial surveys. Together, we can take preventative measures to reduce the amount of trees claimed by southern pine beetles and help keep our trees green and healthy. Before we go, friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including the aforementioned farm-monitor.com. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Stay safe and have a wonderful week.